We're talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. And let's open up a word of prayer, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, again, we can thank you for this day. We continue to give you praise and honor. Father God, we realize who you are in our lives. We realize who we are, Father God. The sinners, Father God, who are here trying to do your will, Father God. We pray that the Holy Spirit will guide and direct our, our paths, Father God. We just are here tonight to try to learn your word, to try to discuss your word, to understand from one another, Father God, what you have given each and every one of us. For we are one body, many parts, Father God, and we have come together truly to glorify you, Father God. So we ask right now that the Holy Spirit be in the midst. Allow us to, uh, you know, just one accord, Lord God, try and do everything we can do to glorify you. We thank you for this time and give all honor to you. In the in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So let's start off here and see if we can get through this this evening. We ended up last uh, week, uh, we were talking about uh, where uh, Jesus had been found guilty by the uh, Sanhedrin, uh, the, what is what the Jewish council, and was now being moved over and was going to be going on to trial through the Roman government. Okay, so we're looking at Jesus' trial before Pilate. And remember, this is a, a conglomeration of all four Gospels on the side you'll see. Which uh, where all of this information, where all these scriptures are taken, where they have been put together by John Piper to uh, give us a better, better uh, understanding of what was going on at this time by before. Uh, the four disciples who were uh, who wrote these, these these epistles. Okay, and where reads, and when they had bound Jesus. And when they had bound Jesus, the whole multitude of them arose and led him away from Caiaphas to the Paratorium, Paratorium and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusations do you bring against this man? And they said to him, if you were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you at all. Then Pilate asked, you take him and judge him according to your law. And the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. And they began to accuse him saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Now we find here, Pilate is looking for evidence. He is the head. He is the head of the uh, of the Roman uh, system at, in this in this particular area, the uh, paraterium. Ter, per, I don't, paraterium is the actual where the military is their court. It's where uh, he basically resides, and everything is uh, all the trials are done right there. So what they what is what do the uh, Jewish what does the uh, Sanhedrin Sanhedrin come to Pilate with? They say that what he they accuse him of that first of all they say what that he's an evil doer. Well, they were trying to convince what Pilate that he has done something wrong. He was not really arrested for being an evil doer. He was being arrested for what? For saying that he was a blasphemy. That he was. The, uh, he was the son of man, and he had not been a, basically a doer. He said he was perverting the nation. They said he was not paying taxes. In his trial, basically, what, he, what did he tell them? He said, render to Caesar what is Caesar. So again, all of these things that they are accusing him of, basically, they were just making it up. They were trying to build a case that Pilate would take. But Pilate wanted to hear some evidence regarding what he basically had done. So the one thing that he did, did take serious was that they said that he said he was Christ and he was a king. Now, kings would be what? Would be somebody who would be going against the Roman Empire and would be what, uh, causing sedition basically across the board. So he was concerned about that. And it implied, what, it implied that he was rebelling against yes, the Roman authority. So he did take uh, 
he took some credence when he said that piece right there. But I think through all of this, what they were trying to tell him was that they want they wanted uh, pilot basically to take what they said on face value, and basically they wanted to find him guilty because they could not put him to death. It had been some centuries before that that uh, that ability to put somebody to death uh, by the like the Jewish courts was not was taken away from them. So they knew they needed uh, his, his approval across the board, and Pilate would be the one who had to find him guilty. So after this, I think Pilate was saying that he wanted to find more evidence. And we look here, said, then Pilate entered into the paratium, paratorium again and asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? And Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom, where if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. In this exchange, what is Jesus telling Pilate? What is he trying to convey to him? What are you, what are you taking from the scriptures here? This is not, his kingdom is not of this world. He asked him, was he the king of the Jews? Was somebody putting something in his mind? What proof, basically, had they given Pilate? Yeah. As of this point, they've only said things to Pilate, but they haven't given him. They haven't given any proof at all. And Pilate wanted to see some type of evidence. Again, he's got a legal court, and he's trying to find out what was going on. And the Sanhedrin wanted Pilate to get, again, to agree to the death, to his death sentence. Um, Jesus basically saying to them that, you know, he's not connected to any political or earthly entities at all. That's not what he's the king of. He would have fought to gain material, but he hasn't fought anybody. He has not put anybody together to fight anybody. That's what things of the earth, that's what they do. They fight nations. Rome goes out and they fight. They put the army together. And they go out and they take things. They take what they want. So again, if I am the king, if I have the authority, I'm going to take this by force. Jesus is not taking anything by force. That's why he said, this is not, yes, I may be a king, but this is not my kingdom. This is not my kingdom. People conquer, the people go out and conquer people by, you know, with wars and things of this nature. He was here, what? Do what? Save souls. He was here to tell the truth. He was no a threat. To the, to the Roman authority. And I think he was putting this across to Pilate, and Pilate was saying, well, I don't see any evidence. I really don't see any evidence here. Now, but the, like I said, the one thing he did take issue with was when he said he was Christ, a king. But again, he had already said that they were lied to him because they came into the courts. He said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Now, it's, Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king? Then Jesus answered, it is rightly as you say that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate asked, what is the truth? Pilate then went out and told the Jews, I find no fault in this man at all. But they were more fierce, saying, he stirs up the people. He stirs up the people throughout all of Judea, beginning with Galilee to this place. And while he was accused of many things by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Pilate asked him again, do you answer nothing? Jesus remained silent, and the governor 
marveled greatly. It's a lot to unpack in this one right here. So Paul is asking him, are you a king? And basically, I said, yes. Uh, I am a king. I was born, what, to come to tell the truth. I was born to come to tell the truth. And everyone who hears my voice, everyone who, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate asks, what is the truth? What is this? I guess what? What were you, what were you disciple from that? Pilate, one of the chosen? He doesn't know what the truth is. Yeah, they're asking. He's not going to lose anyone who belongs to him. He says, if you hear everyone who is everyone who is of the truth, hears my voice. So you belong to Christ. You belong to God. You will hear and adhere to what Jesus is saying. To him. But you know, this is not probably doesn't really recognize that at all. What do you think, Paul? Uh, why uh, Pilate may have marveled at this time. He refused to answer. What was he like? He was in delight. Why was he marveled at this? We probably would have expected him to defend himself, right? If he was Pilate, uh, and, and under all the accusations they were bringing before him. Mm -hmm. Well, look, if you're in court and I have committed the crime, what do you find people are doing? We see all these shows all the time. Say so you don't go to courtroom, but we see enough law and order and things of nature. And if you're guilty, what are you doing? You're trying to defend yourself. <laughs> Especially, and you're trying to preach up your innocence. But again, you're just guilty. You're really trying to say, look, it's not me. That's not me. And Jesus is doing nothing. I think Father right here realizes, he understands what the sand dream was doing. They were jealous of him. They were envious of what he was bringing. And he was saying nothing. So he marveled at it. He was taking it for granted. This guy this guy's for real. This guy is innocent. He really is. Oh, no fault. So after this, he really found no fault in him. Um, and because he found no fault in him, uh, as we said in this next scripture here, when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man was a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod, to Herod's juris jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at this time. So here, you look, says, I found no fault with him. I find no evidence here. These people are trying to say, he's doing all of this. They won't stop it. So they say, look, I'm counting on this off one hair. <laughs> he's not one of my people. He's a Galilean. I'm going to send him over here. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad. For he had desired to see him for a long time and hoped to see some miracle done by him. So again, he had heard of Jesus. He had heard what Jesus had done. Um, and he was really, I mean, he was, he was looking forward to this. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, Herod with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him and sent him back to Pilate. Because Jesus said nothing. And why didn't Jesus say anything? He didn't have to defend himself. He didn't have to defend himself. He said nothing to him. Who did Herod deal with? John the Baptist. John the Baptist was trying to bring the truth to Herod. He wants to listen. Jesus already knew. If he didn't listen there, what, what was he going to say to make change Herod's mind? Nothing. And he did not do anything. So he got pissed. I mean, he got he was mad. But look, 
Let it go back to power. He found nothing to put him to guilt for. He found him in not guilty of anything. So he was just sending him back. Mr. Comment in the chat, Sister Liverman said, mm -hmm. finally put the burden of proof on Jesus to prove who he was. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. He did. So, yeah, he not just allowed him anything of that nature. So, when he sent it back, Jesus sent it before Pilate. Sent it before Pilate. Now, at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner, whomever he requested, whomever they requested. And at this time, they had a notorious prisoner, a robber named Barabbas, who was chained with the other fellow rebels. They had committed murder in a certain rebellion made in the city. You have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Whom do you want to, me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? Do you want me to hand over to you the king of the Jews? For he knew the chief priest and handed him over due to him. Again, remember, we talked about he knew what, he, what, the, what he was doing. They were lying. They were lying to him across the board. And he was trying to put it on him. Do you want Barabbas, this thief, this criminal, or do you really want who is the king of the Jews? They actually envied him. I think we talked about that last week. They were not, they were jealous of Jesus across the board. Nobody, they weren't, uh, they knew, uh, Christ wasn't loyal to Rome. I mean, at least uh, they knew. First of all, they didn't know. They knew that the priests weren't loyal to Rome. They weren't just bringing Jesus there to him just for anything. No, they wanted to get rid of him because within their own religion, uh, they they just wanted to get rid of him. They call it. They call it. When he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, he said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in our presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you have accused him. Neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him. And indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. So what do you think? What, the, what are the, what are the, what are the Sandrine doing? What are the high priests saying now? What do you think they do? They want a little more than him to be chastised. They want a little bit more than him to be chastised. Oh, yeah. They say, Pilate found him innocent. Herod found him innocent. And the only way to put him to death is that he would have to be found guilty in the Roman courts, and that didn't happen. No evidence in two trials. Chastise him, what does that mean? What does chastise mean? Sort of discipline? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's just, it's a form of re rebuking him, reprimanding him, just reprimanding him, look, I'm gonna, that's it, I'm gonna slap you on your hand, send you out, show them I'm gonna be put in death. Because there's found no evidence of that at all. So, what do you think the uh, Sandra, the Sandrians, uh, next move would be? Anybody? Say, what? What are they going to do? Okay, please. <laughs> Come to me, guys. What do you think? What do you think? But the chief priests and elders stirred the crowd so that they should ask Barabbas, ask for Barabbas, and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, who do you want me to release to you? And they all cried out once, saying, away with this man, and release, us, release to us Barabbas. Not this man, but Barabbas. 
Pilate wishing to release Jesus. I mean, said Pilate wishing to release it because he hadn't found the evidence against him, against them. Then asked again, "What do you want me to do with Jesus?" I mean, look, he's trying to put it on them. You don't want to be put on him. What do you want me to do with Jesus, who is called Christ, whom you call the King of the Jews? But they all shouted and cried out again, saying to him, "Let him be crucified." Crucify him, crucify him. Then he said to them in a third, a third time, Why? What has he done? I found no reason for his death. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. So again, they're going over this same thing. They're saying, Look, we want him to put to death. I want him to death. No matter what the evidence shows, no matter what has been proven here, which nothing has been proven. They want him to put them for opposite. Yes. Well, so yes, they really want to put him to death. Um, the Jewish people wanted yeah, to uh, crucify him. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said, Behold the man. When the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out again in loud voices, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said, You take him and crucify him. Why was Paul telling them to, for them to do it? He found no evidence. He found nothing against him. And the Jews told Pilate, this man has made himself the, the son of God and has to be put to death. Pilate then asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus said, gave no answer. Pilate said, are you speaking? Are you not speaking to me? Don't you no, I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you. Jesus still was not answering. Why do you, why do you think he wasn't answering? All according to the plan. All according to the plan. And he hadn't quite matched the authority yet. Pilate, Pilate was telling him what he could do, and Jesus was like, what did he know? The prophecy said what? The prophecy had to be fulfilled. You've got the guy who could put him to death. Say, I want to release you. You said you got the guy who could be put to death? Oh, yeah, he could have done that to Pilate. Yeah. No, no, I'm working. Yeah, that's not true. <laughs> but you got the guy who had authority, Pilate, who has the authority to put him to death. He doesn't want to put him to death. He does not want to put him to death. But the Jewish and the scribes, the priests, they wanted to put him to death because they haven't shown him any energy. And he's doing everything possible. He's been in his back. He's been in his back. Not to go in this direction. Hmm. Why? It's probably going to do his job. He was duly appointed to do what? Be the judge. He, yeah, he, he, to do what he was supposed to do. But he's not going to do it. Why? Maybe not. Did he think something may happen to him? If he did go along with that, if this guy really is who he, who they say he is. Well, and then I think about what he's coming to mind is the fact that Jesus prayed in the garden. Mm -hmm. Lord, if it's your will, remove this question. Mm -hmm. And clearly, he knew this was a mm -hmm. this is what he had to go through. So it's like compare yeah. his father, who he was saying, "If it's your will, Lord, remove this cup from me." To this man, says, "I don't have the power to crucify you." Well, in comparison, though, you really don't have the power. Um, and so, if that if my father doesn't have to do this, then nothing that you do is going to change that. Right. Yeah, I mean, you think about Pilate. Yeah, probably, you know, the wife tells him don't. Have nothing to do with this man in a dream, right? So he really does, in a sense, like I see nothing, no reason to crucify him. But if Jesus, perhaps if Jesus had us spoke up for himself, mm -hmm. maybe he would have let him go. But again, Jesus, knowing the Father's will, exactly. 
he, he remains quiet to go do what you're going to end up doing because he's going to end up bow, bowing to the will of the people right. versus doing what he knows what's right. Exactly. But Jesus doesn't speak to defend himself because he's walking in the will of God. He's walking in the will of God. And, and the truth doesn't have to argue the truth. The truth will be revealed. The truth will be revealed. Yeah. Will be revealed. Uh -huh. And also, I look at this um, as seeing God's hand at work. You know, Pilate doesn't understand, Herod, none of them understand what's going on and why things are uh, happening, but God is working behind the scenes. He has already done, he's already set up what's going to happen. So even though he 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 uh, questions, I have the power to crucify you, don't you realize that, you know, God is already behind the scene. He has no power at all. Not at all. He really does not want to do it. But Christ knows he has to follow the Father's, Father's will. Let me interject something, Doc. Back to uh, the conversation that Jesus was having with Pilate, and more so the question that Pilate asked of Jesus regarding what is truth. That's a very, very important statement when you consider the times in which we are living what is truth? Jesus stood before Pilate as, and before his own people as, if you will, an enigma of sorts. He was a paradox and a contradiction to what the people were accustomed to, how they thought. To them, truth was what they made it. Truth was relative. Truth is me doing what floats my boat instead of truth being absolute. And, and that's what Jesus is bringing before Pilate. I am bringing the truth. But Pilate being who he was in leadership role and the people being as wicked as they were, what they wanted was what they wanted, their fictional reality, if you will. Sometimes uh, this country is compared to, to Rome, definitely in light of where we are as a nation. And we've seen it over the past four years, in particular when the other president was in the White House, where we were seeing that reality was being questioned. And even today, what is truth? And we're living in a time where people are deciding their own truth. I was born a man, but I want to be a woman. And that's one place I can start. So for those of us who confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, the way, the truth, and the life, we really must grasp what is taking place here when Jesus is stating that he is the truth. It is Jesus that we, the church, must follow. It is his truth that we must hold on to in a world in which I can do what I want to do. My reality is what I make it. Truth is no longer ab absolute. And this is, a, this is something that's been taught. This has been taught in universities that truth is relative. It's what you make it and who can question your truth. We or their lives. So we as the church, we got to understand what we are really up against when we state the truth and be bold in the position and the stances that we take and likewise educate our children to know the falsehoods, the lies that are going to confront them in grade school to university. We've been in university for the past five, ten years. Now in grade school. They're bringing books into the schools with alternative lifestyles and teachers are standing there born as men but looking like women. We got to educate our children to what the truth is and to be willing to stand for their truth in a world that's saying that my truth is what I make it and you can't tell me otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's, that's reality. That's for sure that's... Uh encapsulize what we're going through today. It is not true. And it's a shame. I mean, we go through that. We see this all the time. Uh, we see this when we're talking about just morals, whatever it may be, is whatever the majority basically is saying is reality. 
And this is even going past as Tony is saying that. I would say even today we we're so far the left thing. It really is about my truth, what it is reality to me. And you saw, you know, think about 50% they say, this is what is correct. This is what we should be doing because that's doing. But today, there's so much, well, I got to get through this, the fake news or whatever. The truth is people uh, really do believe it's what, you know, whatever they feel themselves and all the things that are going on. But no, we as Christians really should adhere to what God's words because that is the truth. We know that God's us through our lives day in and day out. One, one other thing, uh, Elder Bullard, uh, that, that very last line, um, Jesus was not anxious over the trials that he was going through because, like we said, he knew what God's will was and, and what he was up against. But but I like the irony of Pilate saying, don't you know I have the ability to crucify you? And earlier Jesus had said, Nobody takes my life unless I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I'll pick it up, right? So so even in his thought of what he was able to do, Christ had already told him that no one had the power to do that to him. Uh, he would give up his life, but he wouldn't take it. That's right. That's right. And, yeah, so and, and, and John, and I don't know if you want to cover it, but John 18, you know, Actually, Jesus does respond to Pilate's question. You know, he's like, don't you know I can release you? Jesus is like, uh, the only authority you have over me is what's been given to you by my father, right? That's why Harry got mad with him because first off, he thought Jesus was going to give him a show. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then when he didn't get the show, then he thought Jesus would at least respond to him. And then when Jesus didn't respond to him, then he got ugly about it and, you know, and indignant, and then he sent him back to Pilate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. Okay. To book in my thought, Doc, since we are talking about Barabbas, and they wanted this murderer, they wanted this, this person who represented everything that was in contrast to Jesus. This speaks to the darkness of the people's hearts, such as it is now, and, and how they were lost. And again, the times in which we are living, today there are those who are rejecting truth. And what they don't realize they are doing in rejecting the word of God, they themselves are choosing the rabbits. They are choosing death for themselves. They are choosing mm -hmm. everything that Barabbas represents. And where Barabbas is headed, so will they be also. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's so true. That's so true. So as uh, we move forward with the scripture, Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greatest sin. I'm not sure. He's telling what? He's telling them what? You got no power over me. None at all. None whatsoever. God can do whatever he wants to do. And the one who has the greatest sin delivered me to you. I, it could be Caiaphas, it could be Judas. I'm not sure, but the Jews, the Jews, yeah. Paul still wanted to release Jesus even more, but the Jews cried off saying, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. You may be in trouble. Don't you, don't you do that. Caesar is the man now. You, you report to him. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. And what did we say? He was not speaking against Caesar. He already said, render to Caesar what is Caesar. He was not here. He was not here to go into fights. He was not here to uh, fight municipalities. He was not here to go out and claim land. He was here for the people. He was here to save souls. He was here to tell the truth. 
And when Pilate saw he could not prevail at all, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of this blood of this person. Don't put it on me. <laughs> it's him. Not him. They wanted to release him. They wanted to release him. He got goaded. And they said, it's a stranger. Oh. <laughs> you see to it. You're telling them to see to it yourselves. And the people answered, his blood be on us and our children. <laughs> they really wanted to get rid of him. He gave sentence that it should be. And they requested as they requested and released Barabbas to them. They didn't want Christ. The priests were really, I mean, they're leading the crowd. Again, were they envious of him? Yes. When we see the truth, when we see something out there, we're all what fallen creatures. We're all susceptible to what? To sin. These bad boys were sinning really bad. So they gave them Barabbas. Pilate sentenced him to be crucified. Then Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know. I find no fault. I'm sorry. My corner keeps getting on that. Backwards. Okay. So now, Jesus uh, journeyed to Golapha. And he was led away to be crucified. And he, bearing his cross, went out. Now, as they came out, they found a man from Syrian, Simon, by the name who was coming from the country and passing by. And on him, they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And the multitudes followed as some mourned and some lamented for him. And there were two others criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to this place of the skull, which was called in Hebrew, Golatha, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, he would not drink. And they crucified him. So they led him. Okay, he'd already been beaten. He'd already had he'd been beaten by the uh, pilot people by he'd been beaten by Herod guards. He'd been beaten during this time. So he was pretty weak. And what? They wanted him to take his own cross. He had to take his cross to this place. The crosses at that time were metal, two, a couple hundred pounds where he had to drag it. So Jesus really got to exhaustion and he couldn't take it any longer. And who, find yourself just going down the street and you leaving your country out. And you're just going in the town. Somebody pulls you over out of the blue and say, look, you need to take the cross. You don't even know what's going on. But you had to do what you were pressed upon you to do during this time. And he laid on the cross and he buried it for Jesus. So we get there. And the multitudes followed him, some mourned and some lamented. At this time, nobody was doing this before, but until this point in time, they were all saying, crucify him, crucify him. But some were feeling a little bit, started to feel, okay, remorseful during this time. And you see some of the lamenting going on. Could have been professional mourners, which they do, but uh, it could have been, possibly. Uh, more like that, they, people were starting to get to remorseful because who they're going to actually lose. And there were two criminals laying with him to be put to death. Now, if you were being put to death, that means that they said they were robbers. They were criminals, but they really had done something against the state. Because if you're going to be crucified, you have to be in a situation where you actually have done crime against the state. So this was the highest uh, part of, uh, of uh, being punished. And they took him there, and they gave him some wine mingled with gall. <clears throat> and when he tasted it, he would not drink it. Now, why 
you think he didn't taste it. This gall was like a, a narcotic. It was put into the wine. It was actually given to people who were going to be crucified to deaden their senses somewhat. But they would take this, prolong it, maybe to whatever. But he didn't take it. Why do you think he didn't take it at that time? Any? He had to take on the sins of the world. All the sins of the world. He had to feel them. He was what? He came. He became flesh, just like us. He had emotions. He had feelings, just like everybody else. He usurped his, his authority as being God. He felt like this. And he had to take on this pain that had to be going through. I think about the, the part that no one's going to take his life. So even assuming something that was going to have an internal impact, it's like, no, I'm going to give up. I'm going to give it up. Yes. I would think he would not want his senses to be dull. He wanted to be in his right frame of mind. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to be dull. That's true. Doing what he knew he had to do. So. I think you're right on that. Exactly. Yes. Um, so I was raised in the church. My grandfather was a preacher. Um, I think the, the moment that I, my faith, I think became my own grown-up faith, not the little five-year-old afraid of hell, um, was when I, I was sitting in a Catholic church and I was looking at a crucifix, and you know, they've got the image of Jesus on the cross and I started thinking about everything I learned about every suffering he went through and I think that's what really made it my own was when I realized how much he suffered for me and um, that's when I was just like yeah, I'm great. Yeah. Yeah. well we're gonna that's good meeting the first three hours on the cross, then they crucify him. Then they crucify him. Who else? Give me your definitions. How many of you have seen the Passion? I, I know you have read. We've all read about the crucifixion and read about what crucifixions are, but. Yeah, what, what, what did they do when they crucified you? They laid you on the cross and they nailed you. Yeah. Nailed your feet, nailed your hands, and then just to get you to bleed, I guess it's bad, get you to bleed a little, they stab you with the spear. They even give you a little seat there that you know. Seat, yeah. And then they're able to uh, basically suffocate you. Put up to the, the keep up with your lungs out. You can't breathe after a while. And this is not a short period of time. No, that's right. There's a lot of suffering there. Yes. You're going to be beaten, right? Damn. You know, get rocks thrown at you, scourged. That's the piece right there that, again, if you saw the passion, which brings a lot of light, what truly crucifixion was, what he went through. And again, this is not a quick half an hour. This is not a quick 15 minutes, an hour. This goes on and on and on. Then they crucified him, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they do. Who is he talking about here? He's asking God to forgive them. He's going through this. He's being crucified. He's being beaten. He's being scourged. He is being all the. I can't imagine. I can't even describe what's been happening to him. And he says, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they do. In particular, he's talking about the soldiers. Uh, you know, because, yeah, they're obeying orders. Oh, you know, uh, you know that. the Jews knew what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it was that. I think he's really got the Jews and the, and the, the, the Roman like, like, pilot and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but the Roman, yeah, the Roman soldiers and stuff who were there, even though common decency, you know, uh, at least one of them does have a reflection. Uh, but, yeah, I think he's talking to about that. I would add uh, that not only is he talking about the Roman soldiers and the Jews, he's asking this of all of humanity. 
we, me, you, all of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he died for us. The sins that we have committed, that we will commit, it, he died for us all. So I see this as he's asking this of all of humanity. And we keep in mind that Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world and that his sacrifice was not God's B plan. It was God's only plan. Jesus came in this world to suffer and to die for us. I play a little chess. I'm not that good, but I play a little chess. And what I do know, for that master chess player, he can allow you to make moves where you think you're doing something, but in the end, he's going to checkmate you. And so Satan was checkmate. Paul was checkmate. Everyone who wanted to crucify Jesus, they've all been checkmated, if, if you will. And so when I think about and I've seen the movie, The Passion, and if you haven't seen it, I recommend that you do see it. The depiction, the imagery of what our Savior is doing. And when I sat there and I watched it, I, I, I cried. And when you see what he suffered, uh, the, the lashes that he took, those lashes before he was taken to the cross, those, those cords, if you will, those whips, they had tied within them bones and, and sharp rocks and glass. And so when he was beat with that whip, it was literally taking his skin from his body. His bones were being exposed. He done this for you and for me. He was bleeding out for you and for me. And then the humiliation of the cross, he did it for you and for me. Forgive them, oh God. They know not what they have done and what I have come to do. And so his plea is for all of humanity because we all put him on the cross because of our sin. For all of us, he came, suffered, bled, and died for us. Oh, yes. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. It is. It is an extraordinary thing. Like I said, as I said to Tony says there, uh, if you haven't seen the passion, it is something again, it can be described. You can read it, you can read the words, but to actually see it, it is a humbling, humbling uh, to witness something of that nature. I also like, uh, like, like we're saying, what he went through for us and all that he endured, but even in that. His concern was still for us. That's correct. Right? Yeah. Uh, exactly. What we were subjecting him to. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, his regard was us. Yes. Right. Just like uh, when he prayed for the disciples, knowing what he was going through, he was asking God to protect them. Right. So it's just amazing, you know, our Savior, who was human and went through what he went through, his regard. Assistant, it was for us. us. Thank you. You took a break, sir. No, 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 no. That's what he did. But that's exactly right. That's exactly right on the money. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and the other on his left, and Jesus in the center. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgress transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him wagging their heads and saying, aha, you who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. People having little, what, he have little faith. Come down from the cross. Jesus knew what? He had to go through this. He had to do this. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes and elders sneered and saying, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. 
If he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross that we may see and believe. So you got to see it. Ye a little faith. They wanted to see it. Although they had seen all the other miracles he had done. Time after time after time. Time after time after time. I don't think they still do what they did when they began on the cross. Yeah, you're right. right. You didn't, you didn't, I, go along, I go along with your sister. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I go right along with you. It's like Pharaoh saw mm -hmm. all those all those plagues and saw it. <laughs> Pardoning his heart. one of the criminals who were to be hanged, blasting him, saying, If you are Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Throughout this particular session or this particular section of the book we've been going through to me at least myself is the crux of where we need to learn from this so so what is he saying what is it showing you this is what what is this what is this the, the display of that Jesus is repenting and recognizing how he has fallen in his life and he's acknowledging Christ as Lord Mm -hmm. And asking Christ to give him a place with him. Mm -hmm. right. Never too late. Yeah. Last minute. Yeah. And, and but the physical death is not the end. Mm -hmm. Those two those two criminals kind of represent the two really responses uh, to Jesus. Mm -hmm. You're either going to reject them, right. right, or you're going to recognize who he is exactly. and receive him by faith. There's no neutral ground. There's no in between ground. So, you know, so the, the, those two represent what response we're going to have to who Jesus is. Our eternal life of Christ. It's right here. Pastor said, one here, one here. By faith and faith alone. This man has done nothing. This robber has done nothing. He has nothing to build the kingdom of God. He has done anything. He hasn't been baptized. He hasn't done nothing. And he comes to the realization who this person is. He comes to the realization and he asks for his forgiveness to be with him. You don't have to do anything. It's not by works. It's not by anything on your running. This is the perfect example right here. You just got to really realize that you need to trust. You need to trust in your Lord and Savior. And you'll be with him. And he will save you. I mean, this is the hope. <laughs> this is the hope that we all are looking for. 2 Corinthians 5 and 6 to 8 says, Therefore, being always a good courage, of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. But we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage. I say, and I prefer, and I prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. These bodies we have here are going to return to dust. That is a reality. We live, we were born, we come, and all that we do, I'm out here working for Christ. I'm building up the kingdom of God. I am doing this. I am helping the needy. I am helping, giving, showing love with all my friends, my foes, 
no matter what I'm doing, can all be for play if you don't trust. If you don't trust and have faith. I don't have to see a thing. It's by your faith. And him, and this is faith right here by these two. He believed. And I think Jesus saw his heart. Because that's why he said, you will be with me. The final three hours on the cross. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, the sun darkened. And there was darkness over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out and cried out a loud voice saying, La la, ila, ila, lama sabat, yama. Which is translated in, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The reality, what he's gone through, what? He knew he had to go through it. He succumbed, he gave himself, he knew the prophecy had to be fulfilled, but he's at this point now. I can't, woo, woo. I'm going to think back some of the times I'm playing ball. And I was in the things where I, I couldn't handle it. I was in the eighth grade, I got to tell you a little thing. I was going to say I got a second. In the eighth grade, I, my, my high school went from eighth to twelfth. And you could play varsity. You could just see it and play JV. My brothers are seniors and seniors. Come on, you go home first. You gonna start? They start practice two weeks earlier. JV don't start till school starts. You come out here now. You are gonna get ahead. You are gonna get in shape. You are gonna do this. Two day practices. I go out there that first morning. And I go out there, and I'm saying, God, I'm telling you, I'm eighth grade. Lord, help me. <laughs> I prayed more probably that session than I have ever prayed in my life. Get me through. I did not want to walk off that field. Got home, went to bed. You get a couple hours of sleep, get some eat, go back. They come in the bedroom and say, come away, let's go. Y'all crazy. <laughs> I ain't going back nowhere. I can't play. I'm going to be out there. No. That was... Uh, I ain't come here, but I'm telling you, that was, that was, um, that was, 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 Why have you forsaken me? And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And then he said, and then said, it is finished. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, and bowing his head, he breathed his last and yielded I have a question. up his spirit. But when he said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Was that the point at which he took on all of our sin? If so, then God and heaven could not be for the first time in eternity. They could not be in the same place. So that was his first separation from the Father. I would, say that is yeah. Yeah, I would say that is absolutely correct, my brother, whoever asked that question. When Jesus was on the cross, he was bearing, carrying like that lamb that we see often sacrificed in the old testament again he was the lamb sacrificed before the foundation of the world and so as he hung on that cross he became sin for us it was the love of the father that sent the son it was the love of the father and the son that he bore the iniquities of man and hung on that cross for humanity and because he became sin for us, this in fact was the first time that the triune God had a break, if you will, that the son was absent from the father. He had to be forsaken 
and, and Jesus had never known because he is eternity, eternally with the Father. And so yes. that forsaken has to do with the fact of that desertion, that separation because mm -hmm. of the sins that he bore for all of humanity. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And that really was what Jesus was was suffering through in the prayer of the garden. And right. My right, will, right. you know, is this moment, this moment, be separated from his father, right? I, the physical pain, yes, I think, I mean, it was horrific. But I, I think more than that physical pain is the separation from the father. That That's the wrath that was being poured out, not to experience that communion that he had always had from eternity past. It was the first time in human history, in our history, that it's broken. And that's the weight that he felt did for us. No one took his life. He voluntarily yielded willingly that it's time. I thank you for your time during this uh, this session. It's uh, it's good. We won't be having uh, obviously next Wednesday. We'll be off for right before Thanksgiving, but we will start back. Uh, this Wednesday after Thanksgiving, I think it's the third first, and we'll be completing uh, one perfect life. Amen. Let's close our prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for your word. We thank you, Lord, for having the ability to come virtually and in presence to study your word, to talk about what it means, what how you are ministering to each and every one of us, how we see you, how we see our lives through our Lord Savior Jesus Christ. Father, we truly want to be closer to you, Father God. We want to have a relationship with you, Father God. And we want that relationship to grow. We will always sin, Father God. We ask for forgiveness when we do. We will all fall down, Lord, each and every day of our lives, Father God. We realize that we are flawed people, but we look to you for all of our help, Father God. Let us not lean on our own help, Father God, but lean on you at all times. We love you today, Lord. We praise you today, Father God, for all that you are in our lives. Thank you, God. Let us just be in your will at all times. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Brother Brooks. Brother Brooks. Yes, sir. What was that you said about class we go in? Did you say this is the last class? What repeat yourself, please? Next next Wednesday we won't be having class before Thanksgiving. We'll start back the third Wednesday after Thanksgiving, which I think is the thirty first, where we'll conclude this particular Bible study for the year. Thank you. The thirtieth. I'm sorry, the thirtieth. I get that from the peanut gallery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.